There are two different forms of human cloning that underpin current bioethical debate. Therapeutic cloning is backed by law and allows scientists to create embryos and study them for up to 14 days. The aim is to create stem cells, the starting kits of all the body's different tissues, including skin, heart, brain, and lymph cells. In understanding this process, researchers hope they would learn how to turn one type of cell into cells that make up a completely different type of organ or limb. Thus, an individual skin, cells could be reprogrammed to become liver or heart cells and used to replace diseased tissue. The problem of organ rejection would not arise as an individual's own cells would be the object of the transplant. Reproductive cloning, on the other hand, involves taking a cell from an adult human to create an embryo that is allowed to develop beyond its current 14-day limit and reach the stage of a fully formed baby. Dolly the sheep was created from a single cell snipped from her genetic parent, but this form of cloning is outlawed in humans. Some bioethical committees claim it is time to consider allowing reproductive cloning though they rarely outline under what circumstances it should be viewed as acceptable. In this lecture, I will go over the main arguments offered against human reproductive cloning. Many people feel threatened or disgusted by the idea of cloning human beings. At the moment, the technology is too risky for human clones being produced, but many discussions about reproductive cloning proceed on the assumption that one day the risk will be no higher than the one associated with normal reproduction. The question is whether when we will have reliable technology, there will still be moral barriers to cloning. Let's stop and think for a moment. Why do people feel threatened by the idea of human cloning? Are their opinion biased by skewed media reports on the cloning technology? How much does science fiction shape the way we understand the threats of reproductive cloning? Why do you think some people are disgusted by the idea of human cloning? Are these the same reasons as those for being threatened by it? Let us consider next two arguments which are often invoked against the moral permissibility or acceptability of human reproductive cloning. The first one involves the notion of free will. This general type of argument that people offer against the moral permissibility of human cloning is that human clones will lack free will. Now, whenever I hear this argument, I pause to ask myself, isn't there an obvious reason for thinking the clone would have free will? Assuming the nucleus donor has free will, why would the clone not have it? Putting this worry to a side though, there are two common arguments which aim to show that clones would lack autonomy or free will. Their core claims are that 1. Clones are not ends in themselves and 2. Clones do not have open futures. Let's take argument one. According to its main premise, clones are not ends in themselves. A clone would be nothing more than a project of the people who produce it. It would be a means to their ends rather than an end in itself. According to this argument, to be born as a means to the ends of others suffices to strip you of free will. If this claim is correct, there must be millions of human beings who lack free will. Why am I saying that? To have a child to look after one in one's old age is to have a child as a means to one's own ends. So is having a child to carry on the family name or inherit the family fortune. Then there are those children born to satisfy their parents' curiosity to see how their genes would combine with those of their partner, and those born to parents who just want someone to love, and those born to make grandparents happy. Every year millions of children are born as means to their parents' ends. 
If any or all of these situations is guaranteed to result in a child who lacks free will, then millions of human beings now and throughout the ages lack and have lacked free will. At this point you might say, Oh well, it is true that there are some parents who selfishly bring up a child to fulfill their own purposes rather than her own. If parents bring up a child to believe that her duty in life is to look after the family inheritance, the child may well grow up believing that. These parents have succeeded in bending their child's will to their own. This child might be mistaking her reasons for acting for theirs. When this happens, we might think of the child, metaphorically speaking, as a clone of his parents, a child without a mind of his own. In this sense, children born as means to their parents' ends might reasonably be said, metaphorically again, to lack free will. But even when these children do act on their parents' wishes, this does not indicate lack of free will. They are acting in this way because they have chosen to do so. That is, the mere fact that someone does something at the behest of another person does not mean that he or she is not acting freely. Human beings often freely choose to act as others want them to act. So the first argument against the moral permissibility of human cloning is weak because it is either implausible or at best it implies that human clones, like human children generally, metaphorically lack free will. But perhaps we can argue against the moral permissibility of human reproductive cloning on the basis of another premise. Take argument two, that rests on the premise that clones do not have open futures. This argument claims that clones will lack free will because clones are genetically identical to their donor. It is suggested that unlike the rest of us, whose futures are open to self-determination, clones are doomed to repeat the lives of their donor, to think as they think, do as they do, and become whatever they became. Here the claim is not that the parents of a clone will bend it to their will, but rather that the genetic inheritance of a clone strips it of free will. The argument, if one looks closely, is based on genetic determinism, the idea that identical genomes entail identical futures. But the problem is that genetic determinism is false. Identical genomes do not even entail that two people will be gen genetically identical. If a clone is born to a mother other than the one who carried its donor, then it will differ from its donor in the mitochondrial DNA it inherits. Moreover, identical twins show us that even though, as close as they possibly could be in terms of nature and nurture, same genome, same mitochondria, same uterine environment, same family at the same time, can be extremely different. There is no sense whatsoever in which even they are doomed to the same future. So, the second argument against the moral permissibility of human reproductive cloning can be challenged because it is not the case that human clones would be denied open futures any more than identical twins would. What the two arguments do point out is that the notion of free will is ambiguous. There are at least three senses in which a person might be said to lack free will. One, tables do not have free will and that they are not capable in any sense of choosing how to act. Two, animals, some say, are such that all their behavior is determined by the laws of nature and their immediate and past environments. Finally, human children might be said to lack free will if they grow up doing exactly as their parents choose. If there is any good reason to think that clones would lack free will, this would be a good reason to think that reproductive cloning is morally impermissible. But 
So far, we have not seen any good reason to believe that clones would lack free will, except only metaphorically. But there are other arguments that might push for the moral impermissibility of human reproductive cloning. Sometimes, people worry that because clones are not the result of sexual reproduction, they will not, like normal babies, have unambiguous family relations. For example, Nicholas Clute, the Assistant General Secretary to the Roman Catholic Bishops' Conference of England, argued that every child has the right to two parents. If this is an argument against reproductive cloning, it appears to be based on a misunderstanding. Biologically speaking, clones do have two parents, the parents of whoever donated the nucleus from which they were produced. They might also have two parents in the sense of having two people who, like the parents of adopted children, bring them up. The nearest a clone would get to having only one parent would be if she, and it would have to be a she, was the result of a woman giving birth to her own clone and bringing her up alone. Even in this case, the clone would have two biological parents, namely the parents of the woman who donated the nucleus and gave birth to her. The philosopher Honor O'Neill claims that for a clone, family relationships would be confused because several individuals would hold the role of one and ambiguous because one individual will hold the role of several. She claims that no responsible parent would try to achieve a child by cloning because such a child would have ambiguous and confused family relationships. But is that so? Let's clarify the senses in which family relationship would be confused and ambiguous. Consider the following. If the clone's father is also the nucleus donor, then the clone would be the twin brother of the man he calls dad. The clone would therefore be the son of his brother. His grandparents would actually be his biological parent. The woman he calls mom won't be related to him at all, except in virtue of having contributed mitochondrial DNA in a womb to gestate him. So, the clone could confusedly think of at least two men as dad, at least two women as mom, and he could think of one man ambiguously as either his dad or his brother, and one woman, ambiguously, as either his mom or his grandmother. O'Neill's inductive argument about confused and ambiguous family relationships seems to be more compelling. If it is morally responsible to subject children to confused and ambiguous relations, therefore it would seem morally irresponsible to clone a child. The claim that it is morally responsible to subject children to confused and ambiguous family relationships is, presumably, based on the fact that children with such family relationships have not flourished in the past. If this is true, does this mean that it is morally irresponsible to bring into the world children who are likely to have such relationships? Now, since this is an inductive argument, to properly evaluate the claim that children subjected to confused and ambiguous relationships do not flourish, we would need to examine the empirical evidence. Gathering such evidence is a hard task, but we can bring to bear some considerations that may tell for or against the claim. Take the following cases. Nowadays, divorce is easier. Single parenthood, morally acceptable. So we often hear of children growing up in families where different men at different times play the role of dad or different women play the role of mom. If someone marries several times, their children have to get used to having several fathers or mothers, have siblings, step-siblings, several sets of grandparents, and so on. Do you think that children will do badly in such situations? And if so, is this because you believe they will have confused and ambiguous family relations? A second case. There are also families where the parents work very long hours so that they need to employ others to care for their children. Children can hardly avoid getting confused in such ambiguous situations. Is mom this woman or that woman? Many people believe it is difficult for children to do well in such circumstances. Some go as far as to suggest that people shouldn't have children unless they look after them themselves. Is this 
out of a fear of children being subjected to confused and ambiguous family relationships? Now, what I want to say is that to the extent to which we think that people who bring up their children in these ways are not doing the right thing by their children, and that this is because they are subjecting their children to confused and ambiguous family relationships, we might want to agree with Honora O'Neill. Namely, you might want to say that it would be morally irresponsible to bring into the world any child who will experience such relationships. But we might also ask the following questions. Are children invariably harmed by these situations? And when children are harmed by such situations, are they harmed by the fact that they have been exposed to confused and ambiguous relationships or by some other factors such as the events and state of affairs that led to their having these relationships, the way adults around them handled these events, or the way adults around them handled their, their confused and ambiguous relationships. Pending empirical investigation, there are arguments for and against the claim that children subjected to confused and ambiguous relationships will fail to flourish. In liberal democracy, we do not usually consider the fact that something is morally irresponsible, as we saw in the previous argument, as a good enough reason legally to ban it. So we need to think about this concept of moral irresponsibility and its effects on the law of the land. Something that is morally irresponsible or considered by some to be is binge drinking. But we do not ban it. If the state were to involve itself in legislating against morally irresponsible choices, it would have to interfere a great deal more in the lives of citizens than most democracies deem sensible. If we were to ban anything that resulted in children experiencing confused and ambiguous relationships, for example, we might have to ban divorce or working parents. Legally preventing adults from making choices like these would arguably threaten things we value even more than ensuring children experience no confusion or ambiguity. It would threaten the rights of reasonable adults freely to choose the course of their own lives. During our lifetimes, many, if not all of us, make morally irresponsible choices, especially when young. Many of these choices affect us and others adversely. But being legally prevented from making such choices would prevent us from ever making the sort of mistakes from which we might learn. So the point of this lecture was to consider several arguments against reproductive cloning. Among them, said at the beginning that the safety argument is currently conclusive. But if one day cloning could be made safe enough to try it on human beings, this argument will no longer apply. And this is the point at which you must decide for yourself whether any of the existing arguments suggest that cloning a human being would still be morally impermissible.